I'm a Pommy. This is a podcast. Welcome to the show. We have a special guest today, Mr. Connell Randall. Um, you will have noticed as part of the description or the name of this podcast that Connor has been through the ringer, or you would say, in the last couple of years. But before we get into all that, I just want to talk quickly about our sponsors so big thank you to the london hotel Uh, obviously we're coming up to christmas time um, so please book your christmas parties down at the london hotel in sydney in paddington Um, also if you're looking to refinance your home if you are looking to release some equity to buy an investment property or to do renovations on your house please get in touch my details will be down in the description below let's get started Mr. Connor Randall, welcome. Thanks. Good to be here. Good to be here. Yep. Literally. Got, yeah, literally. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I got that. Uh, no, it's good to be here, mate. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so let's, before we get into the, the big C word, which is what this podcast will obviously all yep. be yep. about, um, talk to me just a little bit about your background and your upbringing, where you're from. So I'm from... Uh, same neck of the woods as you. Yeah, yeah. We actually uh, we actually went to school together. <laughs> you know, if you'd have told me when we were at school that we'd be sitting here under these circumstances, I would, have, yeah, I wouldn't have believed it. <clears throat> I thought I had more odds of winning the lottery. You know. Yeah. But um, but yeah, I'm from uh, Cambridge area in, in, back in England, so a little town called Soham. Yeah, pretty normal upbringing. You know, nothing nothing crazy, nothing special. Uh, been a carpenter for 15 years now, um, and yeah. Two years ago, my uh, my life just completely changed. So, what was um, quite interesting is, uh, obviously, met my my now wife, yep. uh, mother of my two kids, uh, in Dubai, and then we went back to Newmarket, obviously near where we grew up. Yeah, and um, our other halves became very like they the did. scissor sisters, they did. <laughs> Li- literally, literally, <laughs> figuratively. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And um, there were we were both moving to Sydney, or supposed to be moving to Sydney at the same time. Yeah. Um, Sep had already left with with Isla. Yeah. Um, and you and Mary were kind of packing up stuff, getting yeah. ready to leave. We were in like the little annex. Yeah. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> I came over yours, and we had a takeaway and a sort of like see you in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Type, you know. Yeah. You know, yeah. last kind of meal. Next yeah. time we do this, yeah. we'll be in Australia. Yeah, yeah, Woo. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and then, <clears throat> well, I'll let you. I'll let you tell the story. But essentially, you you found out that you were on the brink of death. I was. Yeah, I didn't know it at the time. Soon found out. Though. You had a stomach problem that night. <clears throat> yeah, I did. I remember it. So this was sort of around, sort of the September time, I think. Um, yeah, out of nowhere. So this is a bit, bit of a timeline. So this is sort of late 2021. Yeah, we had flights booked to Australia, I think like November 1st. So sort of around early September time, I started to, um, one night, as always, like we'd ordered a takeaway, me and Mary, and I got a bit of an appetite, pigged out. Suddenly I was like, oh, I'm just a bit, a bit bloated. This is weird. Like I haven't had this before. Didn't think anything of it. You know, weeks go by, doesn't get better, doesn't get better. I start losing weight, you know. I've never had anything wrong with me, you know. Being a 29-year-old, never been sick, thought I was bulletproof. Didn't think anything of it. Oh, it's going to sort itself out, it'll sort itself out. You know, ultimately it didn't. Uh, I ended up going to A&E, and this is sort of like when, uh, when, early when, October now. When did When did you finally go... Oh, this is this is fucking bad. I'm gonna go to I'm gonna go to A and E. Yeah, I think so. It was actually we had our leaving do, um, which I think was um, I think we're talking like early October, middle of October. We had our leaving do on the Saturday. You know, up until that point, I was having sleepless nights, just in so much pain. Um, I was waking up, sort of vomiting, like my stomach contents, like not not pretty. So at that point, I was like, okay. Something's not something's not good. <laughs> oh, okay. like, shouldn't be doing this. Yeah. Um, we had the leave and do on the Saturday. On the Monday morning, I was in A and E, and yeah, that was just the start of it all. Really, you know, I went into A and E in Addenbrooke's in Cambridge, um, and 
given the waiting times. I was there for about 11 hours, which was, which was you know, not fun. Yeah. But they were actually going to send me home. Um, I sort of explained what was happening to me and uh, they were just so busy there. But just as I was about to leave, they were like, oh, actually, we've had a request come through to give you a CT scan. Like, we just want to see what's going on. So I had that and then, you know, the day goes by. This is now sort of, I went there about eight in the morning, half seven in the morning um, after another sleepless night. And this is about 8 p.m. in the, you know, in the evening. And a guy comes, grabs me, takes me into a little side room and he sits me down and he goes, um, okay, so we've seen, we've seen something on your CT scan. We've seen what could be causing, you know, the issues. I'm like, all right, okay. Like, you know, expecting them to just be like, you just got a little blockage or you just got something in there, you know. And he was like, we've seen that you've got a thickening in the wall of your stomach. And I was like, right, okay. And he's like, this is only generally caused by one thing. And then he goes, do you want me to tell you what it is? And I'm like, think I've worked it out, mate. Like, you know, and he was like, could be cancer. Like, it's probably cancer. And at that point, like, when you hear that, it just didn't feel real. Do you know what I mean? Like he said it to me, and I, I didn't feel it. It was it just seemed so like bonkers. Yeah, like yeah, what, like I'm yeah. 29. Yeah, like yeah. what the fuck? Yeah, I was like, no <clears throat> way. Anyway, next thing I know, like I'm in the emergency department. I'm having like a tube shoved down my nose to go down my throat to like pump out the contents of my stomach. Um, yeah, it was a it was this a whole was all thing. in the same night. This was like yeah within, within about 45 minutes of him telling me I'm on a bed like holding something while I'm vomiting, having tubes put down my down my nose. Yeah, a whole ordeal, you know, quite a... You, you end up just sitting there just being like, how has this just happened? You know, yeah. how has this just yeah. happened? You know, and that was really just a reflection of like how the next expanse of time was going to go. You know, you basically just become a passenger and you're just along for the journey, you know? Yeah. So during that time, when he mentions the C word to you, yeah. what's going, like, what's going <clears throat> through your head? It, do, it doesn't sink in, you know. I think I think at the time, I think it was just a reflection of who I was at the time as well, you know. I felt a lot of anger. I just felt angry at the world, you know. I was about to move to Australia, you know. I'd got engaged end of September. I'd, I had a, you know, I had a successful carpentry business, which I gave up, passed it on to be able to move to Australia. You know, I turned down the biggest job of my life to move to Australia. You know, I just um, put the deposit down on a rental property, like all these things that I was like... Everything's going in the right yeah, direction. Yeah, this is going to go in the right direction. Like these are all the things that are going to make me happy, blah, 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 blah. And then it just gets snatched away from me. Like li I remember having to sit in the hospital bed and cancel my flights and just be like... And this is like after COVID. You know, I've been trying to get here for a long time. And, you know, you come out of COVID... And then at the end of the year, when everything's opened up again, mm. you get handed like a, a death sentence, like literally, you know. At the time, they didn't know how bad it was. But yeah, as time went on, it yeah, it wasn't great. Yeah. So <clears throat> after that first night, when when did you sort of realise that it was it was like really bad? I think so. It, the, the because it escalated. Yeah, super quick. It, it escalated, and I mean, so there was like for, from that moment. I mean, I went into hospital. I was I was admitted for maybe like three four days. Um, in that time, there was just a lot of investigation going on. You know, a lot of tough conversations. At the time, they didn't know how bad it was. You know, there was a lot of talk of it being like a lymphoma. You know, lymphoma is much more common in younger people. Things like that, much more treatable. Um, so I was, I was admitted for sort of like two or three days. Then I came out and then I just went through like this whole process of coming in, going for a procedure. So essentially they were just trying to, trying to locate it. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a matter of like, if we're going to find something, it's when we're going to yeah, find something. Where is it? Like, yeah, yeah. it's not a case of, yeah, maybe mm. it's, oh no, this is happening. We just need to find it. <clears throat> and um, so that went on for about two weeks. And then I had a procedure called an endoscopic ultrasound. So essentially, they put a camera down your throat, and uh, they oh, and with a fine needle aspiration. So essentially, they take a, a, a thick biopsy from the entire thickness of my stomach because they saw where the thickening was. But as they were inside my stomach, they obviously used the ultrasound where you can sort of see through tissue and things like that. And they saw that I'd had a tumor which had grown around the exit of my stomach mm. and clamped it shut. 
that was the which, cause of which was all the, the cause of yeah. all the vomiting and everything. So essentially, I could eat and drink, but once it entered my stomach, like you know, my, it, my stomach produced all the acid, break it all down. It just wouldn't go any further. Wasn't going so that's when I started to get the acid reflux with the vomiting. Mm. You know, uh, yeah. It, and then I went from ninety kilo down to, I think when I started getting admitted into hospital, I was down to about seventy five. So I, the the weight loss started to be rapid. You know, um, and yeah, that's so. It was about a two week process. Once they, once they did the ultrasound and they they saw the tumor, that's when I got admitted, um, and that's when you know the operation and it all started. So how so this unfolded in the space of a couple of weeks yeah, and you're leading literally. up to Christmas. Yeah. And then obviously Yeah. So you know, we're we're sort of like early November now. <clears throat> yeah. So early November. Are you still optimistic at this point? Or? Um at this point I don't really know how bad it is. You know, I, I was seeing specialists and I was going to see private um uh, consultants during this time that I was out and you know whilst you know Adam Brooks were doing their own sort of investigations <coughs> I was getting second opinions third opinions mm. and it all pretty much came down to you've got cancer most likely it's lymphoma it's you know one of the guys was like you know it's super treatable and I was like you know what are the cause what is this what is that and he just looked at me and he just went shit luck mate and I was just like Thanks. Great. Right. Okay. Great. Yeah, fantastic. Feel how, loads better. How do I work yeah. on that? Yeah. Yeah. How do I Thanks. work on shit luck? Um, and yeah. So <clears throat> yeah, it was it was pretty crazy. Because I remember when we well, obviously friends, family, everyone starts talking about it, yeah. and the way that it was, <clears throat> I don't know, the message was being passed around was, uh, I was thinking, oh, maybe maybe he'll be out in three months' time. Like him, like maybe it'll just delay them and they'll come out in February or. Or March yeah, or whatever. That was my thinking. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think that's yeah. what I think that's what we yeah, were all thinking. Yeah. Um, I was like, I still might make summer. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but what was the what was the sit down moment for you when they were like, um, you're essentially knocking on death's door? Yeah. So I was admitted into hospital, um, and there was just a there was just a period of time where obviously family were coming. So when the consultants would come in like there was a degree of separation between what they said and like sort of what I heard like you know my family and partner sort of acted as buffers before it sort of got to me but I remember there being a few times where um you know there's moments in particular where I remember you know laying in a hospital bed um my partner's laying over me just crying my mum is to the right of me laying over me just crying in front of me is just like a wall of doctors and you know the guys the main doctor is sort of standing there and he's saying look it's a stage four tumor it's metastasized to the pancreas to the gallbladder there's um nodules up in the abdominals you know we have to perform this operation so they were going to go in and try and remove the tumor but i remember moments like that you know where you've got fat where you're just witnessing like your loved ones like I remember hearing my aunt who had come to see me when she was hearing the news at the, for the first time. I remember hearing her just screaming down the hallway of the hospital. That's when you're kind of like, yeah. oh shit, yeah, like yeah. this is real. Like, you know, mm. this is crazy. But like I said, like at that once, once you go into hospital and once all this starts happening, like you really are just along for the ride. Like it, it took a long time for me to be able to actually digest once, it. Yeah, once the dust had settled, to be able to sit and be like, okay, this is happening. You know, that whole time in hospital, obviously I'm getting pumped full of drugs. <laughs> There's all sorts going on. You know, I'm, I'm having operations. So I'm not really with it a lot of the time. Mm. So that passed quite quickly. It wasn't until like that was over and I was at home that I was, I then had to deal with it basically. And stage four, <laughs> like how long does that give you? So stage four basically just means that it's no longer where it originated from, right? So I got diagnosed with, um, I wrote it down, uh, a stage four uh, anadenocarcinoma, right? Um, and it metastasized to um, the pancreas around the gallbladder. I had um, nodules up in my uh, abdominal area. Um, they gave me um, between eight weeks was probably one of the shortest prognosis. I got eight weeks. Um, I got told I wouldn't make my 30th birthday, um, which was May in 2022. And the the longest one I got was two years, which took me to October just gone. 
So, yeah. So, happy to still be here. And he's happy, still here. Happy to prove <laughs> more wrong, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, so when you start hearing eight weeks, when mm. you start hearing, you know, so f- for me, like, obviously, I've been in my profession for 15 years, right? I've, I've learned to, there comes a, a certain amount of knowledge and sort of, you know, when I meet people who are in the same sort of industry or who have got serious time in their profession, you know, I, you learn to sort of respect what they have to say. And, you know, I was in a, I was in the medical environment and there was not a single doctor backing me. You know, they were all like, this is bad. Don't look good. Like, it's (laughs) not looking good, mate. Do you know what I mean? And it's kind of like, for me, like to see people that are like in this business, know what they're talking about to be like, touch and go yeah this, one. this is not looking good mm. you know it it hits home you're like shit this yeah. is real this is happening so when <clears throat> you're going through this whirlwind and obviously they, they tell you you've got stage four cancer your family are probably falling apart around yeah. you the doctors are telling you you're gonna fucking die yeah you got you got eight weeks to 12 weeks to put you know one guy's up to two years but really it's like well it, fucking yeah. it's Anyone. coming yeah. like yeah yeah, um, yeah it's coming um <clears throat> You you get sent home at one point after yeah. that. Yeah. So um, so I had a uh, operation. So they went in. They basically went in to try and remove the tumor. Right. Um, went in there, realized that it was just too advanced. They couldn't remove it without causing me serious damage. Basically, you know, they couldn't remove any of the metastasis or anything like that. You know, it was like say around the pancreas, super sensitive area. So they couldn't remove it. Um, so basically what I had a partial um, bypass so essentially they um, the exit of my stomach they basically blocked it off sewed it up and essentially created a new this is proper layman for like not very scientific <laughs> you can't tell and they essentially just made me a new stomach. exit to the stomach yeah, yeah. directly underneath so I've got like a plug hole essentially yeah. so that was just done just so I could start eating and drinking again so this is like sort of early december now um how much do you weigh at this point at this point i'm i'm in i'm in the 60s i'm going down in, into the 60s i think i'm sort of around 63 kilo something like that so from 90 like when it all started happening mm. and uh yeah so i was i was in hospital for about eight days after that operation and then they send me home but looking like, like a skeleton oh yeah like did not look great <laughs> Wasn't a good time for me. Um, you not know, looking your best. Yeah, not looking my best. <laughs> had had work. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't great. Yeah. Um, I got sent home and I was home for a week. But um, you know, I've been in hospital for a long time up until this point. A lot of drugs going through my system. I've been getting fed through a. Um, I had a pick line in, which yeah, is. Uh, so I've been getting fed through like a TPN substance, basically just like all your electrolytes and stuff like that. But now I had to eat and drink of my own accord. And obviously I had all this, the swelling from the stomach and, and from the operation. So I basically was home for about a week without eating and drinking. I, you know, I continued to vomit. And I went, I remember I had an um, appointment with the surgeon a week after I was released. Went back into hospital. Surgeon looked at me and was like, oh, you, you have to stay in. Like, you are about to die. Like, yeah. you know. They ran my blood, so I just had super low levels of everything. And they were like, you're so close to heart failure. They were essentially like, the only reason you're living and breathing right now is because you're young. Like, your body's just going for it, you know? But This you know, is in a space is of about two months, three yeah, months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I've gone You've from... You've gone like, from being a normal human being, yeah, yeah. doing your day-to-day yeah, yeah, carpentry, to running like, your company, yeah. ready to go to Sydney, and then you're 27 kilos lighter. yeah look like a skeleton yeah, like, been told you're gonna like it's yeah all over get out of bed walk to the sofa that's all i can manage to do lay on the sofa <clears throat> just like i have no energy i have nothing in me get up when it's bedtime go to bed like that was it and it was it was tough like being able to like look at yourself in the mirror and, and like, just this isn't me yeah yeah you're like yeah. who is looking back at me who is looking back at me you know i remember the day that i went in to see the surgeon i remember looking at myself in the mirror before we went and my eyes had shrunk in their sockets, you know, because I was so dehydrated. Like I could just see space around my eyes. And I was just remember thinking, oh, that's not good. Like, <laughs> that's not a good look. <laughs> what is happening? You know, and then yeah, yeah. obviously as soon as he took one look at me, like he recognised it as well and was like, yeah, you have to say in. Yeah, fine. Yeah. And are you, in, um, are you in a fight or a flight mode at this point? Like what? 
do you, do you, did you feel like there was like there was a way out? Um, I think at this point, I still was still just trying to process it. You know, oh, it was all yeah. still happening so quickly. Um, I yeah, I wasn't much of an optimist. I really wasn't. You know, as soon as as soon as I got diagnosed, my you know my partner and my mum they started joining forums and they started reaching out to people to just try and find some sort of hope. And you know, we heard stories of people getting through it and things like that. But I just wasn't in the mindset to be able to even take any of that in. You know, I was just Con- like- so focused on how I was feeling at that time and just how awful I was feeling. I couldn't really think much outside of it. You know, it was happening at such a rapid pace. Um, but yeah, I think it was once once I went back in and he kept me in, I was in for another week. Um, I remember then I came out and then I started to do better. You know, I, I that once they hooked me up back into the hospital... I was able to just to clear some things out and whatnot, and then I was able to sort of start eating and drinking again. So it was around then that I started to, when I was at home constantly, and I started to regain a little bit of strength. That's when I could like really sit and just be like, "Whoa, like, well, yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> what has just yeah. happened? Yeah, yeah, I should have been in Sydney now on yeah. a beach somewhere, yeah. um, starting my new life. What? Um, when did when did the like a uh, a recovery program sort of start for you? Um, so it was a few months on. So I started my first round of chemotherapy. So I come out of, so when I come out of hospital and this for the second time, this is like a week before Christmas. So we sort of have Christmas. I start my chemotherapy on the December 27th, um, 2021. So obviously New Year was cracking. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, it was Had really a great fun. time. Really, really fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> first three months you know were just I was just in it I was doing I I was having uh, full fox chemotherapy so I was getting that every two weeks and I really wasn't at that time you know Mary my partner from the get go she was reading books you know she was doing the research you know she was finding sort of you know these success stories these radical remission stories and you know she was trying to looking at every single yeah, approach to try and keep you alive. Any basically, any yeah. string of hope, <clears throat> diet, supplements, the lot. But I was just in such a dark place at that point. You know, I was I felt a lot of resentment. I felt a lot of anger just towards the world. You know, just how could this happen to me? Like mm. just as everything was about to happen, how can this happen to me? Do you know what I mean? I just was feeling, yeah. I just I really wasn't through the acceptance phase. Um, plus then you obviously tie in the chemotherapy which is not fun Um, I'm quite lucky that I tolerated it really well Mm. you know I still was quite active and stuff like that but it was once the once everything slowed down you know I'd gone from being just a hundred mile an hour in my normal life to now like I'm on the sofa watching Netflix and YouTube for like a week at a time yeah like my my world stopped and slowed and you know once everyone started going back to work and Mm. I was just settling into like my new sort of normal, you know, that's when, you know, depression sort of really hit me um, and sort of like the acceptance phase. Um, But all the while, Mary was just reading and learning and putting things in place, which now like, unbelievable. Like they changed my life and they really like helped me get through it. But at that time, so it took me till probably my, my first cycle of chemotherapy, which was three months, it wasn't until I got to the end of that before I really started to implement like alternative methods. So what had <clears throat> Mary and obviously your mum been looking into for these alternative methods to for so, you and also for you to start actually thinking, oh, I'm gonna listen to them and start yeah. l- doing it. So a big thing that we <clears throat> we a big thing that helped us sort of pinpoint my cause of cancer right was you know i'd had every test under the sun once you get diagnosed at my age you know it flags up to a lot of different sort of institutes you were getting blood tests and all over the world oh yeah yeah i had samples sent to america like i was going to um different hospitals within england you know i had the cambridge genetics uh department ring me up they couldn't find a single cause for my cancer like they couldn't find it you know they i remember they rang me up and they were like if we saw your blood samples and we saw your tissue samples and this was happening to you like, and this wasn't happening to you, we would tell you that you, you're all good. Like yeah. they were like, so 
it's still down as cancer of unknown origin, basically. But we started looking at the type of person that I was leading up to it. You know, my whole life I've been someone who suffered from chronic, chronic stress. Like I really was not in a great mental state. Like you wouldn't know it if you saw me. Like you know, just chatting. I've always just like being around people, always been positive and things like that. But within my own head, you know, it was a different story. In and your head when you were on your own? or Just, just, in, just in, in general, general, you know, just in general. From, you know, experiences as a child, from what I was exposed to, you know, and just how I learned to deal with that and what it manifested into, into adult life. Like, I was just completely blind to it. I had no idea that it was having that effect on me. So once I got diagnosed, me and Mary pretty quickly was like, this is this is down to me like this was just down to like how I lived my life in my head you know so we really started pinpointing and researching well Mary did um mental health and the effects that the brain can have on the body you know she started reading uh books like radical remission and books called cured where you know you speak about these people that have had these wild diagnosis and gone on to live a long happy cancer-free life mm. and the mental side of it just jumped out. You know, she was reading these these books and was just and she was like, linking it straight to you. This is Connor. This is you. Yeah. This is him to a T. This is Connor. You know, and what were some of those things? Like, what were some of the things that used to go on in your head? I just, I I attached a lot of sort of like my self worth to material things. You know, certain like having wanting to achieve certain things to <coughs> achieve a certain degree of like happiness within myself. Obviously, once I, once I got diagnosed and like you're about to, you feel like you're about to die. Suddenly, all these things that you have valued and you goes you know, out the window. Goes out the window, and you realise you just been chasing <clears throat> pointless shit, meaningless shit. Like, so I did buy my first. I bought my first rental in between um, that week that I had out of hospital, and I only did it because I was like, well, at least I'll have something to leave my partner, right? But that was something that I busted my ass over and I obsessed over because I thought it was going to give me a certain feeling when I achieved it and I remember getting the keys you know this was like just before I started or just after I started chemotherapy I remember I got the keys and I was like I couldn't give a shit like this is not important Yeah. and it really made me evaluate sort of what I found myself worth through you know and so that was a big thing for me. It must have been quite difficult to navigate because you've spent <clears throat> obviously due due to whatever happened in your upbringing um you've got this obsession with success yeah probably Unhealthy. probably very similar we we went to dinner that night and i didn't know much about your background you didn't know much about mine and it was like we were very similar in our yeah. mindsets but also like i've learned as well since having kids and stuff like that that it's just not the most important thing yeah um <clears throat> how do you navigate um I don't know, spending the first 29 years of your life thinking in a certain way and then obviously death knocks on the door and you go, oh, that was all, that was all fucking yeah. pointless. I, you yeah. know, really. Yeah, it was, a, it was just a whole <clears throat> process really of me having to, you know, I, once we pinpointed this, like I knew it, like when, when I was sitting in the hospital bed, like I knew that it was down to my mind and my mental health, you know, when I think back to certain points in my life, you know, while I was by myself, while I was driving to work and just the noise in my head and like how my head was just screaming at me and I, it was just my normal. Like I just thought that was how everyone was, you know, and it and it isn't like it's not normal. And it's I think it was going through that sort of process of acceptance and then, you know, going into like the more alternative methods. And when I eventually reached the point when I felt like I could talk to somebody, you know, because I had barriers up for a long time. But eventually... Why, why do you think that was? Like, why do you... I just didn't believe it. You know, I thought <laughs> I thought all this wellness stuff was just a load of shit. shit. I thought it was just a load of mumbo jumbo, just some pretentious stuff. Do you know what I mean? Like, I just... I just was just had this attitude of, like, oh, I'm all right. Yeah. I'm all right. Only actors in yeah, America go right. and see therapists. Yeah, I don't need it. Yeah, I don't need it. I've been to see, like, a therapist before... But it was, you know, not saying that everyone is going to be like this, but it was just a lady in her living room, you know, and I just did, I didn't get any benefit from it, you know, yeah. so that didn't help me 
Yeah. They they actually say a lot of the time, um, finding the right therapist yeah. is the most important oh, thing, yeah. and the way that that person delivers that session yeah. is super important. Because I remember when, um, well, Foxy would talk about it. The guy off um, SAS who's an ex Marine SBS soldier, and he he just didn't couldn't relate, and that person couldn't relate to him mm -hmm. either because mm -hmm. they'd obviously they hadn't fucking been through any trauma themselves they were yeah. just some like normal person that had had a normal life and decided yeah. they wanted to become a therapist and he had to go and see someone who would take him for a walk in the woods mm. and you know he'd be out in the outdoors and you know whatever that would help him yeah you know it took a certain person to yeah. be able to talk to the right yeah. you know the right individual yeah and i can definitely <clears throat> account for that now i mean so yeah i i just had balls up i just thought you know like meditation and stuff like that oh, i was just like oh i can't do that like it's not mm. for me you know that was just my attitude across the board really so my partner on the other hand you know believes heavy heavily in that sort of stuff so she was always sort of recommending it to me and i had friends you know telling me you know you should go talk to someone you should go talk to someone and i just i just needed to get to that point myself really and mm. i think you know, once I was sort of into like the second cycle of chemo, you know, um, I just, I was just so low that I was like, do you know what? If it's going to help, I'm going to do it. Do you know what I mean? I just got, I just bottomed out. I was yeah. like, it can't I'm get exhausted, worse. Yeah. I'm like if fucking, you're, mm. if you're going to, you know, if you're going to give me a thread of hope, I'm just going to tug on it and I'm going to see where it goes because anything's better than this, you know? So I just got to that point where I was happy to go speak to someone and she really sort of unlocked my, I really was able to then sort of see how the things that happened to me manifested into my adult life. You know, I was able to see like the reason behind my habits and, you know, my traits and my thoughts. And I was able to sort of step back and sort of step away from my programming a little bit and understand and see and be like, oh, what was I doing? Yeah. Like, I was able to see the bad thoughts. I was able to tap into a different way of thinking and be like, oh, I can think like this. I don't need to think like like that. And that was sort of the start of it really for me. What was it like that first session? Um, emotional. Yeah, it was definitely emotional. Um, but I got a real sense of sort of like how you just mentioned with Foxy, I sort of just walking into her office, just being in that sort of environment, seeing how she presented herself. You know, I'd said to myself before, cause it was down as hypnotherapy, right? And I was like, oh, it's just gonna be someone like waving some medallion or something like that. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean, that's what I thought it was gonna be like, but it wasn't that at all, right? It wasn't that at all. And I remember, I remember before I went in there, I just said to myself, I'm just gonna give myself to this <clears throat> process. I'm just gonna let this person do their mm. job and I'm going to let them, and I'm just, you know, I'm going to drop my walls. So I went in there and yeah, I just sort of, it was emotional. I had, I had multiple sessions with her, you know, over time, but I found such benefit, you know, being able to sort of reach that sort of meditative state, bring up past emotions and be able to sort of analyze the situation and, you know, the circumstances around them and understand how that led me to feel a certain way and be a certain way you know it's it was it was transformative yeah so at this point you're you're going through the chemotherapy and then you're starting to adopt um for yourself yeah alternative yeah. sort of routes and avenues yeah. and uh, and and so what so alongside the chemotherapy and and the other therapy the hypnotherapy what what else were you what else was Mary begging you to do? So yeah, yeah. So so immediately I cut all sugar out of my diet, you know, cut all refined sugars, everything like that. That came out, you know, cancer metabolizes glucose, right? Loves the stuff. So I just cut it out of my diet. I started eating as cleanly as I possibly could, you know. Um, we would just buy organic food as best we could. I started juicing a lot of veg. Um, you know, I'd have a regular supplement routine, sort of morning, lunch, and, and evening. Um, and then sort of alongside it as well, you know, I was taking a lot of sort of THC oil, um, which I was given, you know, by a guy. You know, <laughs> there's, there's, always, there's always a guy. Um, that to me was, for, for me on my journey, you know, 
not necessarily recommending it to people, but it was instrumental for me. Um, just for how it helped my mental health, you know, being able to sort of relax me. Um, and I actually started to take it alongside my chemotherapy, mostly because obviously it was super strong. It would put you on a different planet if you if you really wanted it to. And when I was going into oncology to have the chemo attached to me, I wanted to be on a different planet. You know, I didn't want to be there. Feeling it. So <clears throat> I would take, I would take, I'd take the THC. I'd put my headphones in. I'd put my hat over my eyes, and I would sit there while they hooked me up. I'd sit there for about three hours, have the first load put through me, and then I'd get like a pump attached to me, and I'd be sent home for another two days. Um, but the whole time I was in hospital, I was just headphones in, and I was taking this stuff. But I soon found that actually it stopped me from vomiting. It it eradicated for me all side effects that the, the chemotherapy brought really mm. like in terms of sickness. And that was a big game changer for me. And it really sort of helped my mental health whilst I was going through the treatment because they give you a lot of medication which does a lot of things to your body, you know, um, and... I got to a really dark place on that medication. You know, I really did think about ending my life at one point. It was it was really, really dark. And I remember going in to have the chemotherapy taken off once it was finished. And I remember them asking me, oh, how, you know, how did you find it? And I said to him, I was like, look, physically I can deal with it. It's fine. Like I'm going to work, you know, I'm, I'm back sort of in normal life. But my mind is terrible. And they were just like, oh, that's the steroids we're giving you. And I was like, what do you mean? And they were like it helps your body process the chemotherapy but also you know they're not great for for the mind and once i heard that that was it i um that was sort of like into my second cycle so i'm already starting to do the alternative stuff but i'm still in this really dark space i actually started to stop taking those medications that they gave me now i'm not advocating people do that it was an intensely um you know you were it was well, my basically. decision it was a very <clears throat> intimate decision that i had to come to myself you know, I didn't do it immediately. I did it over time because, you know, if they tell me it's supposed to help my body process it, then suddenly I don't want to cut it out and put myself in a bad situation. But the THC that I was taking was removing any symptom that I was having. So it, it made it easier for me to come off this medication. As I came off this medication, my mind got so much stronger. Those dark thoughts went away and suddenly I started to really feel the benefit of the work that I was doing mentally. You know, I had uh, one of my aunts, she would come around and meditate with me every day. You know, she's big into spirituality, big into meditation. So she started to come around and we'd meditate for even just half hour, you know, but at first, you know, I bet you were like the whole time the I'm fuck? sitting down, I'm like, my ass is hurting <laughs> on these wood floors, <laughs> my back hurts. I'm thinking about what I want for dinner later, yeah. you know, this, yeah, isn't for, this isn't for me. I've done it, and your your mind drifts off, yeah. and it and it takes you, you quite a number of sessions for you to sit there and just be able to be in your yeah. thoughts rather yeah. than just drifting off and yeah. thinking about. And it's all about recentering it. Yeah, and it, it's okay. Like you can drift off a little bit, but as long as you're aware of it and you can just bring it back. Yeah, yeah. It, but it is a struggle. At the oh start. yeah, it's you a really skill. got to train it yourself to do it. Like, yeah, yeah, you know, it's <clears> a skill, and like I still struggle with it now. You know. But, um, but those were the sorts of things that I was doing. So it was diet, you know, it was massive, massive onto mental health, um, you know, uh, and yeah, it was just trying to, and reading, educating ourselves on altern further alternative therapies and, and looking at sort of testimonials of people that have gotten through it and just anything that you could do to sort of bolster your belief in your situation, basically. So you, and... Are you past that? You're past that 12 week point, right? Where they were like, you've only got eight weeks. Oh, yeah. I mean, so I, like, you know, I started just knocking those prognoses you know, <laughs> out of the park. I was like, eight weeks. <laughs> I was like, 30th birthday. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, I, yeah, I was feeling good. Like, and, and my scan results, you know, I will say my scan results from the first one were positive. From the first session from the of chemo? From the, from the very first scan that I had. So you, you have a scan at the end of each three months. First one that I had showed a reduction all round happy days and then the second one showed that the nodules in my uh, abdominals were resolved you know great fantastic you know Next. good news <clears throat> but even then like when I got that news by the doctor I remember saying to it I was at work at the time because I on the week that I was off 
I would go back to work, right? And I'll just do little jobs that I could get done in a week. And I remember he rang me and he told me, he was like, oh, the, he was like, the nodules in the abdominals appear to have resolved. And then he was like, and there's a reduction all around. And I just remember saying to him, so if it gets to a point where it's small enough, would you be able to operate? And he just goes, oh no, operation, an operation is, is not an option for you. This isn't about curing you. This is just about giving you time, right? And that's what he said. And that's what he said to me down the phone. And I'm like at a customer's house, just like fitting their floor, just on outside being like, oh, okay, thanks. Fucking cheers. And it was just such a kick in the nuts to like, you know, I've just had this great news, but then it was just completely overshadowed. And that was one thing that I really sort of learned through this process is you're going to have a, you know, if you get diagnosed, you're going to have a lot of stuff said to you. You know, and it's to take it's it or not, leave it. It's not going to be nice, you know. And you know, I had some dark stuff said to me, which put me in a bad headspace. But you just, yeah, you just got can't to be it. can't be helpful, regardless of how <laughs> shit the diagnosis is. Right? Yeah, regardless of whether they say you've got a week to live or yeah. whether you've got five years to live. Yeah, surely the way in which they deliver that message, yeah, is going to have a obviously a massive fucking effect on how you're feeling oh yeah which you know like i've been in the fitness industry for a long time before i come to sydney and the the way that you know a lot of our training was in emotional intelligence trying to figure out how someone is feeling when they walk through the front door Mm. because you want that person to repeat and come back to the gym or Mm -hmm. come back to doing their fitness routine or you know get that turning key point where they do start to lose weight or whatever it is but like you've got to wait until they're ready to process that right but you can't you can't just turn up like if someone's if someone's like oh you know i don't feel like training today so all right well let's let's sit and have a chat yeah and we'll discuss how you're feeling today rather than waste the hour yeah but let's yeah but if a doctor's going to deliver results like that that that's gonna the, the amount of stress and pressure is gonna reduce your immune system. Oh yeah, 100%. and have a negative effect yeah. on how you're gonna potentially possibly fucking cure it. Yeah, like yeah. Did you find that a lot of doctors were like that? Oh along yeah, the I, I learned road? after that. I learned after that to <laughs> ask no questions. I learned to have as yeah. I, they, when they would ring me and give me my results, they'd be like, oh you know, because um, yeah, all my scan results were good news. They'd be like. It's good news. It's holding stable or it's reduced. But I'd be like, okay, thanks very much. And they'd be like, you got any questions? No. Nope. Yeah. Like, you know, or after each round of chemotherapy, they give you a call just to see like how you tolerated it. And I'd be like, yeah, all good. You know, I'm talk- like my phone conversations would be when I'd look at the call log afterwards, you're talking like seven, eight seconds. Like, yeah, yep, yeah, cheers. All good. Yep, yeah, thanks. Because I learned my lesson that day that I I'm was just I, not going to I was never, yeah, I'm yeah. not going to ask because I don't want to hear it, you know? Yeah, you know, I it, feel fine. Yeah, so don't tell yeah. me that I'm not feeling yeah, fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because he could have just said, you know, it's it. Those have been resolved. That's really good news. You know, reduction all round. But then, you know, he had to just hit me with the old, uh, "You're never going to be cured, haymaker." And I was like, "Great, <laughs> thanks, mate. cheers, mate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, nice one." <laughs> so you're, um, you're in an optimistic state at this point. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Like I, I, <clears throat> a long time ago realized that this has actually been the biggest blessing to my life that I ever could have hoped for you know and to be sitting here now as I am like I really wouldn't have changed any of it you know I really had to be taken to that point of bottoming out and just thinking it was all gone for me to really sort of work on yourself yeah just wake up you know I took I took a lot in my life for granted the people in my life my partner you know I just took it for granted. I just wasn't aware of what great people I was surrounded by, what a great partner I had, what a great family I had, you know, and it and it took for this to happen, for those people to sort of rally around me, for me to realise that. And then for me to be sitting here now with the results that I've had, you know, through all the prognosis, you know, as much as I have had immense help, you know, I've also done this myself, you know, because without that help, without being willing to take it on and go on the journey, you know, I wouldn't be here. And it fills me with immense pride, you know, and I am proud of myself, you know, and I find happiness in just the simple things the simple in life things, now, yeah. you know, just, 
yeah, it's and my mind is so much quieter than it used to be. Like I think back to how I used to think, and it's like it's crazy. Like I'm I'm still very much a work in progress, but like I've really sort of put in the hours on myself, you know, and I'm really am um, feeling the benefit of it, you know. So it's a shame that it takes most people to bottom out, get diagnosed before they actually do something about it. Yeah, you know, I really was just a very very average person nothing special about me but when push come to shove like i I've, I've just dug to a level that i didn't know i had and like it's been great you know as much as that was you know a baptism <coughs> through fire sort of thing <laughs> coming out of it now like i'm a different person and all mm. for the better you know my family is closer i'm closer to just the people around me I'm living in Australia now. I made it. Do you know what I mean? It's when it's amazing what you can actually do when you're pushed and you actually apply yourself. You know. So run me through the. Um, you're obviously like doing a lot better now. Run me through what your day, like what your normal day looks like from a um, from a health perspective. Like the way the way that you start your morning, yeah. all the way to the end your day that might might benefit anyone not someone yep. that's just like had some sort of like cancer scare or anything but anyone that's like i don't know losing focus or doesn't have a sense of direction or feels a bit lost and they're talking badly about themselves in their own head yeah what 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 is your what does your morning to, through to the evening kind of look like from a from a normal day for so, you now so i found out one of the big things for me actually was to just give myself time in the mornings um back when I was like working full time like pre all of this you know I would get up half hour before I had to be on site you know it's up clothes on you know take away coffee sandwich on the go driving to work you know you get to work and suddenly you're like 45 minutes ago I was in bed like how am I here now you know it was allowing myself time in the morning to just sort of wake up you know now I implement meditation into my morning so as soon as I get up I don't look at my phone you know I leave that alone you know, it doesn't matter. So I'll get up, I'll go and meditate for probably half hour. Hasn't, you know, I've built up to that, you know. Yeah. And then Maybe I'll go start and, with five minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But these are things yeah. like, it's easy for me to sit here now, like two years in and be like, well, this is my routine. But like, these are yeah, like, two years ago, these you were like been, little yeah. incremental things that I started to do. And over time, they've just given me great benefit. You know, at the time, I had no idea that they would, but, you know, just little changes. So, giving myself time in the morning to sort of meditate, to have a coffee, to have a proper breakfast, to be like, okay, I've got time before I need to leave for work. You know, just maybe watch a, a YouTube video on something that I enjoy, you know, that just sort of, I watch like a guy that rebuilds cars and I found enjoyment in that. And <laughs> I would just sit down and I'd have my breakfast and I'd watch that and be yeah. like, oh, that was great. And then I'm like, right, time for work. Just little things like Giving that. Giving yourself a little bit of rest yeah, before yeah. the day starts. Um, I'd, take, I'd do a uh, celery juice um, juice as soon as I wake up. So after the meditation, I'll go in, I'll have that. And then I'll take my supplements. Um, and then, yeah, I'll sort of have my chilled morning. I'll go into my working day. And the whole time, like, I'm just super mindful of m my state the whole time, mm. you know, because I have that liability my you know my mind was such a wild animal for so long like it doesn't just go away yeah you know i do need to monitor it yeah, and it's I, work and in I, progress yeah, yeah i yeah. do need to stay aware of my traits and my tendencies as yeah. that goes on it's funny because i like I, you know i've got two kids under three and me i'm we i think i'm very lucky that me and sep like to have our morning like like yeah. what you say like a bit of space so when we wake up in the morning sep sep leaves the house goes immediately to the gym she gets her hour she stops off grabs a takeaway coffee she gets a bit of respite in her brain you know she gets to uh, just after after having a workout it's like you can attack the no matter what problems yeah. come your way if you don't have that in the morning suddenly for some reason your decision making's worse mm -hmm your brain's a bit foggy, you're stressed out. When you start the day doing something really hard or going through some sort of mind, mindfulness meditation, whatever it is, um, it just sets you up to be a better person that day. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I yeah, when I <laughs> meditate in the morning, I mean, if you'd have told me a couple of years ago this is what I'd do, I'd laugh at you and be like, I'd never do that. 
But like I, you know, I would sit there and I would literally just be like, okay, how do I want to be today? Like, what do I want? How do I want to think? How do I want to act? What am I not going to allow? You know, what old habits and old behaviors am I not going to allow past my awareness? Mm. You know, really sort of setting the day with that intention, I found to be massive for me, you know. Um, and then, yeah, I sort of carry that through into the day. I always try and get some time for myself. So if I get back for work, I'll go for a run or I'll go for a walk, um, read a book. I started writing in a journal. Start That has, has given me massive benefit. Um, another recommendation by my partner. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that was a big thing, you know, just being able to just write down how you feel, how you felt that day, what sort of thoughts you... Cause you know, you do it long enough, you can look back and you can sort of see things that crop up and you're like, oh, okay, I think about yeah. this quite a bit. I think about this quite a bit. Why do I think about that? There's like a pattern that comes Yeah, 100%. Up, yeah. And it can just help you sort of like understand things about yourself. And then, yeah, in the evenings, you know, I really try not to just be on my phone. You know, I, I really, I mean, when this first happened, when I got diagnosed, I erased social media off my phone. You know, I realized right then and there that that wasn't going to be yeah, healthy for me. Yeah, you did go me. quiet for a while. Yeah, yeah, stop posting, <laughs> funny enough. Yeah, yeah, it weren't up to much. Um, but just, I just become really conscious of things <clears throat> outside, things that could affect me. Mm. And I just sort of know what's good for me and what isn't, you know. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's been great. And you think, like, do you, do you put... Um a lot of those things that you now do, which is like a normal, like obviously like you, when you guys moved over, you stayed with us and I just saw you go through your day, all the supplements that you take and yeah. all that type of thing. Um, obviously the chemotherapy is, was an absolute lifesaver for you. Yeah. Um, and then luckily it helped you get to the point where you'd built up enough strength that you were like, okay, like I think I can attack this. Yeah. And you were clever enough to realize probably through going through the hypnotherapy that you were like, oh, I don't want to listen to these negative things that I'm yeah. being told, so I'm just going to ignore those uh, and 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 think about the positive. And then obviously Mary was having a good influence on you with all these other, yeah, yeah. <laughs> other things yeah. that you would have never have done the year before. Yeah. Um, when, so when you, when you move to Australia, do you still have cancer at that point? Yeah. Yeah, so when I... So yeah, it was it was a big decision to come off of, of chemotherapy, but I think we saw, you know, just as a bit before that, when I was waiting to have my scan, sometimes I would be off chemo for three, four weeks. Um, and in that time, I would see myself bounce back pretty quick. My body started to feel good. My mind started to feel good. So it was from having those moments that yeah we start that's when i really got the confidence to to go alternative and to come off i started to see because as soon as i went back on the chemotherapy i started feeling bad again i started to you know it was as probably essential for me at the start but then i personally you made the personal decision i personally too. got to the point where i started to see it as like a bit of a ball and chain you know it was holding me back mm. a big motivation obviously to come off of treatment as well a lot of it was i just wanted to have some taste of normal life you know um, I was, desperate. I was desperate for that. Yeah, yeah. I was. De I wanted to have the pick line out of my arm. I wanted to just not have to go to the hospital every week. So I think that was a big motivation. But then as time went on and I started to just feel good and then I had two more scans before I came out here and they were all good. It was all holding stable. Um, the metastases were still there. I think I was about sort of 60% resolve potentially so the abdominals was gone the metastasis was was decreasing around the pancreas and the and the gallbladder but it was still present the tumor was holding stable um but that was enough we were like that's good enough yeah, like yeah, yeah. we've seen that and that was without treatment yeah. we were like we've seen that Dr. We Tommy was going to be dead yeah, 6 months ago yeah we can at least <clears throat> hold this thing mm. like in its place let's just go like what's holding us back you know and yeah, we, it's we a big decision the, to make. Oh, yeah, it's a big decision. Like, crazy decision. Like, you know, family and that were like, oh, are me? you fucking are sure? You, are you sure? Like, <laughs> yeah. Is that the best thing? But, like, you know, you just got to do what's right for you. And it was, you know, it was my dream, like, our dream to come out here. And it was just like, we'd seen so much. We'd read so much in the books of people that just went for it, you know, and just saw the benefits. And we were like, maybe this is my thing you know <laughs> let's just give it a go and let's give it a whirl you yeah. know we came out here and 
yeah, I went back in May, had a scan in May, and it showed that the metastasis was all gone um, and the tumour was completely stable. Um, and that was all just from being out here and just living my best life, you know, just enjoying being here. Taking it all in. Yeah, yeah. Like, it sounds like I live like a monk, but I really don't. Like, I, I definitely... Mm. A little bit. Half yeah, monk. yeah, yeah. I mean, well, yeah, half monk, yeah, no, part time <laughs> monk. Yeah, yeah. But like, it, it really, I've adapted it to my lifestyle. You know, just the diet, the no sugar, that sort of stuff. It's just second nature to me now. You know, mm. seemed a lot when I first did it, but it's not a problem. But yeah, from just being out here, we realised pretty soon that we made the right decision. And then you had a little bit, bit of a bump. Oh yeah, did just spend six weeks in hospital. Um, yeah, which I came out of about two weeks ago. Uh, completely. Just run, let's let's just run because the uh, like when I picked you up, I was just when you explained the situation to me, I was just like, holy shit! Yeah. Like, what the fuck's just happened? Yeah. So <clears throat> about probably probably about two months ago now, I started to experience symptoms. Um, I went through like a bit of a. It just shows really that how much you actually do need to maintain your mental health, you know, because you think, oh, he's had all these great results. He's moved to Australia. He must just be on cloud nine the whole time. But, you know, eventually you do return to earth and life sort of takes hold of you. And I definitely went sort of unconscious to some of my old habits and my old stresses and worrying about money. You know, believe it or not, having cancer and then moving to one of the most expensive cities on the planet is not great for the wallet. <laughs> so I uh, I definitely started to stress about money and stuff like that again. Once I started to, you know, allow stress into my life um, to that sort of level again, I started to experience sort of symptoms and changes in my body. That led to my eyes going yellow, like really not cool stuff, um, you know. And then we got to a point where we were like, okay, you know, we were in denial for a little while because it, it, just the fear comes back, you know, when you start seeing certain things or f like my body became really itchy, you know, these are new symptoms that I hadn't had before. Fear, denial, you know, the work sort of comes back. But then we you know we were decided we were like, right, OK, let's just get some awareness. You know, let's just find out what's going on. Went to the doctor on the Friday, no, on the Thursday, you know, but before we went in, based on our past experience, we knew what we were getting ourselves in for. You know, I'd done enough work now to be like, you do realize as soon as we dip our toe back into this realm, like we're going to have some stuff said to us that we're yeah. not going to like. Yeah, yeah. And we sort of like armed ourselves against that and were prepared for that. <clears throat> so I sort of took myself to the doctor, you know. Without Mary. Without Mary, <clears throat> you know, and I got... I'm really worried. This doesn't look good. Blah, 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 blah. He put me through for like an emergency CT scan. So that was on the Thursday. On the Friday, I had a CT scan. On the Sunday, I was admitted into hospital. Um, so I was in, yeah, the North Shore for, well, they said I'd be in and out within a week and I was in there for six weeks. Um, but yeah, basically, as soon as I went in again, and they learnt about my diagnosis and whatnot. Your past records and my stuff. My past yeah. records, you know, you show doctors. They were like, you, fuck. <laughs> it's funny when you show a doctor my medical history, they sort of do a bit of a double take and they just sort of look at me and they're like, are you sure? Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, so given the symptoms that I was sort of showing, um, it didn't take long for the old, you know, you should consider going back to England. This isn't looking good. Given your prognosis, you have an incurable cancer, like... I cannot tell you how much longer you've got left. You know, I started, all of this started coming back to me, but only this time I didn't have my mum, my partner, whatever family member was present at the time as a buffer before it got to me, you know, and I had to sit and have these conversations, you know, with them myself. Mm. How did you handle it? It was tough, but to be fair, I actually handled it pretty well. You know, I, I really put the work in mentally like I really I knew what I was going to face you know and I knew within my body that I didn't feel like I was in any danger you know I wasn't having any pain or anything like that and I also sort of had a bit of a confidence of like right well I've done this before I've proven that I've done it I've got the test I've got the scientific results to prove that I have done this myself 
So I just had to keep reminding myself of that basically. And, you know, meditation was a massive, massive asset for me during that time to just keep my mind level, to not let, you know, my mind run wild with, you know, speculation and, you know, you know, to have a doctor come in and say those things for you. And like when he's the head of the gastro ward and he's got his own private practice next door, you know, and to just sit there and be like, no, no, like, no, no. Like it takes a lot, you know, because you don't want to be just, plain feigning ignorance like in denial like you have to be totally aware of what it could potentially be and what is happening to you but still within that be like it doesn't matter the outcome is going to be the same so i went through you know six week process i had i ended up having like an external drain fitted so essentially i i had a blockage on my bile duct so i had a drain fitted so for about three four weeks i was carrying around I had a had a little shoulder bag which had a just a bag full of just my innards in it basically. <laughs> like it wasn't great. It was not a good look. Good look. Yeah, it was not great. Um but from that, you know, got through it, very proud of myself and yeah, had some pretty amazing results at the end of it, to be honest. And let's talk run through the results because I think it's pretty wild. Yeah, yeah. So obviously the whole time I was in there once they saw my diagnosis it was okay it's the cancer it's killing him like he doesn't have long you know alarm bells going off um but once I started having biopsies taken they all started coming back negative they all started coming back negative for cancer it even got to the point where the hospital questioned the original hospital's diagnosis and they were leaving it open to speculation that I'd been misdiagnosed based on the fact of how I was looking in front of them with what was written on this piece of paper. Um, So yeah, the weeks keep going by, you know, um, I keep having more biopsies, more biopsies, you know, the doctor would come and see me and be like, right, we've got a huge team meeting about you tomorrow, you know, head of this department, that department, they're all coming in, they're all like deciding and wondering what to do next. Still, I was having biopsies, still they were coming back negative. So eventually they installed a a temporary stent. um, So basically to just hold my bile duct open and you know i had a pet scan which basically like scans your whole body and it can pick up sort of cancerous cells and how active they are um so about three weeks ago um i got discharged from hospital um you know once the, once the stent was in doing its thing i sort of went back to normal and they could let me out mm-hmm. i had a follow-up consultation with oncology who wanted to just basically just put me on their books and and you know get me up to speed with what could happen and i remember i sat down in there and she was like, well, all of your results have come back negative for cancer. All of your biopsies have come back negative, even the ones around the blockage on the bile duct, things like that. And she was like, and your PET scan. Um, so, you know, the scan which shows active cancer cells within your body. She was like, your PET scans come back showing no active sign of disease in your body whatsoever. So she was like, you don't actually need us. Which, and you know, and at we- that point to hear that, it was just like crazy and then a lady comes in who saw me when I first went into hospital when I was all yellow and stuff and was like wanted to see me and see how I was getting on and then there was another knock at the door and it was one of the head gastro doctors who came in and just sat in front of me and just went I just wanted to come and put a face to the person that we've all been watching for the past six weeks she was like we have all been watching you behind the scenes you are a special case you know they didn't ask me what I've been doing or anything like that but just that sort of like nod that acknowledgement of like holy shit yeah we've done it you shouldn't be here yeah yeah like fair play you know and that was pretty much almost to the date of the two-year prognosis when i was told pretty much guarantee he will not make it past this i'm sitting there having doctors come in to meet me to be like fair play mate like (laughs) Fair play, uh, you know. So well done, mate. I basically well, cheers to some water. Levitated out of that blooming oncology office. Well you know, you couldn't touch me after that. It was great. It felt great. Fucking that is just what a journey. You know, it's just fucking nuts. That is, uh, it inspiring. Like it's just like you. I don't think anyone knows what 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 was going to go through their heads or whether they're going to go into a fight or flight mode yeah. when they get a diagnosis like that. Yeah, and I think a lot of people just give up. <clears throat> yeah. So kudos to you, mate, for fucking yeah. persevering and Appreciate looking that. at every possible avenue. Yeah. After a little bit of time, yeah. every possible avenue, fucking to yeah. go down. Um, what what would you say? What would you say to someone? Not necessarily someone that's like been diagnosed with cancer, but someone that's been given some bad news. Um, any 
any pieces of advice that you'd give to be like, like you you got to, I heard a thing where Jordan Peterson said this the other day and he said, he said, one of the worst things that can happen to you is you get told that you've got cancer and you've got a choice at that point. And it's either fucking sit there and cry and moan and whinge and or the, and the alternative is death. Yeah. So you've either got to pick yourself up yeah. and give it a crack yeah. or you just got to give up. And, yep. and let it take over. Yeah. What would you What would your advice be to someone that's got just had a really bad news on on anything? You know, they could have lost a limb or yeah, you know, whatever. It's, you've basically been handed like an opportunity, right? And I know it sounds, you know, if you'd have told me two years ago, well, this is an opportunity, I would have been like, Fuck jump off. out the window, mate. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. But you really have been given an opportunity to sort of show yourself who you who you really are you know and you know you've you've sort of been given an obstacle worthy of the person that you're going to become you know like sitting here now after going through all of that I wouldn't wish it any different you know but it was a, a conscious effort to make it that way you know you can make you know the worst thing that happened to you into the best thing you know mm. you, you can do it it takes work it doesn't just happen immediately but also you need to know that these tough times, I think it's very easy when something bad happens to you, you think that this is it for the rest of your life. Like I had times where I was like, well, this is it, this is me, this is it. But as time went on and I started to believe in a different future, you know, these times are only temporary if you mm. make them so, do you know what I mean? Like yeah. it took for me to change, for me to realize that, but it is only temporary, you know. And through this process, there's obviously been a lot of people that have been with you by your side, helped you out. Yeah. Um, who are those people and what would you say to them? So, I mean, first and foremost, I mean, Mary, my partner, has just been from the get-go, talk about somebody who was just completely stoic in, like, their belief of he's going to get <laughs> through this, you know, to have somebody in your corner from, like, go just saying he's going to do it he's going to get through this was monumental for me you know even when my family was falling to pieces Mary was still like no he's going to do this he's going to do this and like don't get me wrong she had her wobbles but I mean you're talking like one or two times I really saw her lose it over this time and you know and she's completely entitled to you know the emotion that she was holding on to but even still she did the research on the diet on the mental health everything that I do now I do at her recommendation you know and they're they're things that I've grown to love and to value in my life you know so and my family as well rallied around me you know I became so much closer to to my family my friends you know yeah it's just been that everyone's been amazing you know I, I'm here it's very easy for me to sit here and be like I I I and me 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 and I made it here and I beat it but I always had a team of people behind me who were just completely backing me and just doing whatever they could to care for me and to make my time easier and to help me in any way that they can. And yeah, I am eternally grateful to those people. Like it, it didn't go unnoticed and I feel incredibly grateful to have all of those people in my life, all my friends, all my family, you know, my amazing <laughs> partner. Yeah, I'm, I feel incredibly grateful and I, I feel grateful to be in a position now where I can actually realize it and see it you know because mm. I it was it was always there but I just didn't know it I was yeah. just so blindfolded by my own shit and my own ambition you know that I just I didn't know but it was there the whole time and uh, it's great to finally be able to sort of recognize it and see it and to say thank you to those people you know awesome awesome and what does the future look like for Mr. Connor Randall <sighs> do you know what I always thought you know before all this oh, I'm a carpenter that's just my lot like I you know that's it but after getting through this like how can you not believe that you can be capable of anything you know and I think I definitely want to you be an astronaut <laughs> yeah, well, yeah you know <laughs> you know got to be a little bit realistic <laughs> but you know I think for me like I definitely want to start being um you know I'm sort of getting back onto social media now and I sort of want to I sort of want to be that person that I would have needed two years ago you yeah. know because there wasn't a lot out there and you know there was a there was a young man that that my mum found some hope with who had the same diagnosis as me and 
Uh, it was the same age as me, lived up north, and he helped my family at the start, you know. And I do the celery juice today because of him. Like, he's the one that recommended all that sort of stuff. Um, but he sadly passed away, so I just want to, you know, give a big thanks to that guy, you know, Chris. He was fantastic. Um, but I want to be sort of a success story for these people going forward of, like, you can do this. Mm. Um, and... Yeah, I'm just trying to navigate my way through that now. You know, it's I'm dipping my toe into a world I have no experience in, but all I can go off is what I've been through and, you know, what I'm continuing to go through, you know. So that's sort of where I want to take this. It's exciting. And where so if you're obviously going to start sharing some of some of your yeah. some of the things that you do on a daily basis and your rituals and, yeah. and how you sort of live your life now, how do people get hold of you or so I look into that. I have been pretty. Have you barren. got an account yet? Yeah, I, I, I set up a TikTok account about half hour before you pick me up for this. So um, yeah, you'll be able to find me uh, just at Connor Randall. So C O N O R dot Randall R A N D A W L. I'm sure they'll put me on the the podcast, but I'll be the guy with no content and no followers. Yeah. Um, so but, if you're the first follower, yeah. that'd be great. Yeah, but I will be um, uploading content. Yeah, daily routines, sort of anyone who's got any questions who's sort of going through the same sort of thing you know I can give advice on how I navigated that point in my life um, and you know I'm more than happy to go into more depth about sort of the diagnosis and that sort of process amazing well thank you for sharing it's your story great. and uh, and getting it all out there well done for still oh, cheers, mate. you know <laughs> little blue being around yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give you a gold gold yeah. one of the gold ones yeah, you get the yeah, gold yeah, blue yeah, Peter yeah. badges um, but yeah, mate, absolutely amazing, uh, and and great to have you as Uncle Connor. Yeah, yeah, in, appreciate in that. In my life as well, yeah, mate. So yeah, that. just just awesome. awesome. Thanks, mate. Thanks, thanks for having me. And uh, don't forget to like and subscribe if you need any help or you've got any any questions for Connor. Just reach out in the comments, and we'll get we'll get back to you as quickly as we can. Cheers, guys. Thanks.